Uh, sorry for my voice, I got a bit sick over the weekend. Uh, I got sick because of Brexit. Happened <laughs> <laughs> on Friday. Uh, and this part of time, certainly doesn't uh, realize political reality, they don't care <laughs> whether the Brits are in or out. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to the Institute, first of all, for this invitation to, to speak to you and exchange notes with you on uh, this particular topic. Uh, the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union, which is uh, a truly a historic event, I would say. And uh, I'm quite sure there are many uh, very similar events all over Europe and beyond, uh, where people try to, to analyze the state of play, where we are and what, what we can expect uh, from this uh, development that the Brits eventually left the European Union. Certainly you can analyze it from different angles, and I try to highlight some of them, especially of course what it might mean or what it means for us Hungarians, for the Hungarian uh, politics, uh, Hungarian economy, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction to my portfolio. And uh, truly, uh, previously I was in, in charge of uh, Hungary's EU policy coordination, so what kind of policy we represent to the European Union in different areas for five years, so I, I lived through some quite uh, tense uh, debates with the European Union since 2014, including the, uh, the referendum result that was reached in 2016, and how, developed, how, how Brexit uh, issue has developed since then. I think we should not go into the analysis of why Brexit happened, because uh, it would divert us from a kind of uh, uh, you know, pr predictions about the future. We could go back to the 100 year old war or we, can, we could go back to the goal and uh, how the Brits eventually could manage to join the European Union in 1973 and how difficult it was because of the French. Uh, uh, until the goal was in charge, uh, it was very much against the Brits joining the European Union and we know that the UK has never been really associated emotionally, psychologically with the European Union. It, it has always been a kind of uh, sub-tenancy. They, they were renting a flat, but they never belonged. Uh, and they, they say, you see, in today's communication, they say that we have been uh, bad tenants, but we will be excellent neighbors. And that's, that's, that's one of the communication of the British political elite. Uh, what you could see is that uh, it was one thing that the majority of the British voters eventually decided to, to leave, and certainly British society has been and is still divided on whether it was a good decision or not. So almost half of the, uh, of the Brits are very unhappy uh, with them leaving the European Union. We can see that new movements have emerged, the movement of reunion and others, uh, uh, you know, the, the movement of the Remainers. Although I think uh, in a relatively short period of time, uh, this will be irrelevant because uh, the fact of the matter is that they have left the European Union uh, in legal terms. The EU, the, EU, the United Kingdom left the EU on Friday, Friday midnight. And this is the second working day in our life where we are without the UK. But uh, practically, until the end of this year, nothing has changed because the United Kingdom uh, still obliged herself to fully comply with European Union law until uh, the end of uh, 2020. Uh, the so called transition period, which was part of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, they committed themselves uh, to, be, to remain, to be part of the EU. Uh, with the exception that the, the, the Brits are not participating in the work of any EU institutions. So they are not sitting at the table of the Council of the European Union. Uh, we don't have any more uh, British members of the European Parliament since last Friday. And they did not uh, nominate a commissioner to the College of the European Union Commission as well, which is quite strange because all the rules apply for them, 
and during the course of 11 months, but they are not participating in the work, which is a kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, I wouldn't say gesture, but it's a part of self-inflicted commitment uh, by them. This was part of the deal. Uh, was it good for us, Hungarians? Was it good for the EU, for the member states? I believe yes, uh, for two reasons. And uh, one of the, the first and maybe the most important uh, uh, goal of the Hungarian government was to, to protect the acquired rights of European Union citizens, including Hungarians, living and working in the United Kingdom. And this has been fulfilled. So I can say that in this respect, uh, it's good news for everybody that there was an orderly withdrawal, which means a, based on a deal, because this deal guaranteed the rights of the citizens and everybody who is or will travel uh, to the United Kingdom until the end of the transition period, until the end of December, they will be entitled to register uh, in the UK until June 2021. And as a result of this registration, they will be entitled to a settled status, or if they have not been staying there for five years, a pre-settled status. It means legal stay, legal employment, and uh, of course, full access to uh, social insurance, institutions, education. Uh, and later on, should they fulfill the obligations, they can even acquire a UK citizenship. And this has been guaranteed by the British government, both the Theresa May and the Boris Johnson government, uh, and I think it's good news. Uh, we are talking about 3.5 million Europeans living and working in the UK. The Hungarian community is uh, sizable. Uh, we don't have exact figures because the Brits did not use to have any form of registration before Brexit. Uh, they introduced this settlement uh, scheme now. What we know is that until the end of December, about 80,000 80, Hungarians registered, 79,400, uh, which is the most probably half of the size of the actual uh, community, which is somewhere between 150 to 200,000 people, scattered all over the United Kingdom, Scotland, Wales, or some other island, mainly in England, many of them in Scotland as well. The Hungarians are not among the top 10 communities, if you look at the size. Uh, the Polish are the biggest, over one million Poles. Uh, but then Romanians, Italians, Spanish, Greek, so also Southern Europeans are a huge uh, number. Uh, but if you look at the size of the population, the Baltic countries are very much represented. The the Russians, Russians. <coughs> Russians? Well, we don't have figures because no, they are not the <laughs> So we, we, don't, we, we don't know. Uh, we are not following, although the, the UK has a, the statistical office has some, some figures that they publish annually, uh, monthly. So we are following the, uh, those publications. So this has been uh, guaranteed. And that's good news because uh, it's always a responsibility for any government to protect the rights, the quiet rights of our citizens. Regardless of the fact, of course, that the goal of the Hungarian <coughs> government is not to keep them there but to attract them home, because we need the Hungarians back in our country. Uh, the Hungarian labor market would badly need these people. But it's an individual decision, of course, and it requires many other different aspects, how we can attract people back, the bad, you know, economic policy, economic growth, wage level increase, so it's a complex issue. And we try to keep a continuous cooperation with Hungarian communities uh, everywhere. My colleagues, myself, we travel to many cities all over uh, the UK in December, we are in Scotland, in, even in the remote parts of Scotland, in the Western Highlands, and in Aberdeen, Inverness, where we have Hungarians, Edinburgh, Glasgow, but all over. Uh, we have a, of course, a full fledged embassy in London, we have a consulate generally in Manchester, and a consular office in Edinburgh. And uh, they try to keep a lively co cooperation, you know contributing to keeping their Hungarian identity. Because we do hope that uh, a large number of them will eventually choose to come home. It doesn't mean that they cannot uh, obtain a UK citizenship and they can become double citizens. Why not? After all, they are paying all the taxes, they are paying all the social insurance, so they are low-abiding good citizens of both countries, and, 
And uh, if, you, if you work somewhere for five years, uh, of course, uh, you try to get uh, what is based on law. You would do the same. So it's no problem with them. So this is one very important element. And the other one is that with a deal-based withdrawal, orderly withdrawal, the British committed themselves also to pay their financial commitments to the European Union's common budget until 2020 December. <coughs> As you know, the European Union has a seven-year-long budget, but that's according to the annual financial framework. The negotiations of the, of the next period has just started. Some of the Prime Ministers, including the Hungarian Prime Minister, visited a small city in Portugal over the weekend when uh, the so-called Friends of Cohesion Policy uh, leaders gathered Prime Ministers, I don't know, 14, 15, I don't know exactly how many, but uh, certainly Central Europeans, but also Southern Europeans, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, they started to negotiate the next uh, framework, and financially speaking, it's everybody's interest that the British pay until they leave, uh, and it's good. So, we are happy that eventually it, it took place. It was not easy, because as you know, the previous British government, uh, Theresa May, although she reached the deal <coughs> with the European Union, but she could not sell it at home. The British Parliament, the House of Commons, rejected it three times, which eventually led to the resignation of the Prime Minister. And the new Prime Minister was installed, Boris Johnson, and he also reached another deal with the EU in October last year, and then he couldn't sell it at home, uh, because the House of Commons rejected. So what they needed to do, they needed to establish an early election in December. Uh, it was a major decision, because as you know, the Brits love their traditions, and they never hold elections in December. <laughs> they always hold elections in the spring. I think it was last in 1923 when they organized the election in December. As a result of Brexit, they had to do it again. And Boris Johnson won it with a, with a huge majority. And I think uh, we have to commend him for that. If politically, it was a big achievement, especially in a quite hostile international political and media context. That was very critical to him and his policy, his character. Uh, I don't need to introduce him to you, everybody knows who is following international politics. But uh, what he achieved is remarkable. And at the end of the day, he could put together a huge majority in the, in the House of Commons, which was again a guarantee for ratification. So in a way, in a way, we can be very grateful to Boris Johnson, and we are. Because had he not won the election with a big majority, this uh, uncertainty would have remained. And the uncertainty was the single most uh, uh, negative or uh, uh, you know, imbalancing uh, kind of factor since 2016 for businesses, for citizens. Nobody exactly knew what would happen. Many, many in, in the UK, in Europe, were hoping that no, no, they will not leave eventually. Because they don't have a majority for that and you know, everything will turn back and they will remain. There were a lot of hopes a lot of false uh, interpretations. And uh, this British election eventually put an end to that. And it managed to break through this uh, deadlock. And now the situation is, legally speaking, quite clear. They left. They are not members of the EU anymore. And there's a transition period. So from, I would say, the political Brexit ended. It's over. Uh, now, the economic Brexit is not, and that's, that's the biggest uh, thing now that, you know, businesses are calm for the time being because they, the business, you know, reacts to the new environment. It's quite flexible. They are trying to work out new business models, adjust to the new realities, they restructure, refocus. What is the worst for business is uncertainty. Now, this uncertainty remains a bit uh, until the end of this year. <coughs> what will happen now? The timeline is that uh, just yesterday, uh, the leaders came out with their starting position. 
Boris Johnson made a speech yesterday in Greenwich at 12 o'clock Greenwich time, very symbolic, where he outlined his vision, his vision for the future. And at the same time, the chief negotiator on the EU side, Boris Barnier, also made an intervention a couple of hours before in Brussels, where he presented the proposed negotiation mandate which still has to be adopted by the European Parliament and, more importantly, by the Member States. So the Council of the European Union will have to adopt the new negotiation mandate for Michel Barnier. And this will happen at the end of this month, on the 25th of February, at the General Affairs Council meeting in Brussels. Now the positions are quite far. The starting positions are quite far. Because Boris Johnson said that uh, we left the European Union because we wanted to regain our sovereignty. And we would like to realize our global leadership. And we don't want that any form of the European Union law and the competence of the European Court of Justice uh, uh, would, uh, would, would be competent for us. So, I think it's, it's a legitimate position. Eventually, they did not leave the European Union uh, just to commit themselves to EU law. Then why they left? So, politically speaking, it's quite legitimate what he's saying, and we understand that. And we believe that we have to respect this position uh, on both sides. Um, now, on the other hand, Michel Barnier said that, of course, uh, we don't want to be hostile to the British. After all, they are a European country, and they will remain to be a European country. A former EU member, our neighbor, our friend. At the same time, my job, said Michel Barnier, is to defend the interests of the European single market, the member states, and the European citizens. And that's also a very legitimate position. And we as Hungarians, we belong to the EU27, of course, uh, we align ourselves with the position of Michel Barnier. And at this point, let me tell you that uh, I praised Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. I similarly have to praise Michel Barnier, who is a, quite a rare figure in our <laughs> assessment of the European Commission. Because Michel Barnier managed to deliver what very few uh, could in the last couple of years. He, he managed to sustain and maintain the unity of the 27 member state, states, which is an extremely difficult exercise. How can you keep, you know, first of all, how can you reach a unity and then maintain the unity? It's very difficult in any policy areas. And in, in such a very difficult uh, matter like uh, our relationship with the British, he managed to do that because he had a very good recipe. Uh, he communicated with the member states. It's not that, easy, not that difficult after all. If there is a will, there is always a way. And he, he traveled to all the capitals. He regularly met the leaders of the member states. So everybody felt that there is a genuine interest from the Commission on our, on our concerns. Uh, and I think this is the recipe. If you, if you completely ignore vital economic, social, political interest of a member state, and it will be impossible to keep uh, the loyalty. But he managed to do that, I think. And this was a good, very good method. Everybody was very much uh, satisfied with his work, and it's no wonder that the Prime Ministers mandated him again to conduct a future, future uh, relationship uh, talks as well. And uh, he's a very focused, very down-to-earth figure, a very, very experienced diplomat. He was a commissioner of the single market before, so he knows exactly what the single market means and the value of the single market. He was uh, the Minister of Fisheries of France at one point, so he knows exactly the interest of French fishermen. 
And uh, he was also one of the organizers of the Albany Olympic Games. So, very colorful uh, figure, and, and, and he is very collegial. I also met him a few weeks ago, 10 days ago in Brussels, but he, he comes to Budapest from time to time. And uh, <coughs> I can say that uh, our position, our starting position, is quite close to that of the European Commission now. Because uh, this is what I told him. To that, thank you. We should we should look at the what is our alternative goal. Our alternative goal is to reach a new and fair trade deal with the British, and this should be the the driving guidance for everybody. Now, of course, you you will never reach a deal if you set up unrealistic conditions to them. So we have to be realistic. On the other hand, of course, we cannot also accept that once they left the club, they certainly will not be able to enjoy <coughs> all the benefits. So we must find a, a good balance. And this is the, the huge aspects. Now what are the what are the areas where uh, the positions are very far from each other? Uh, first of all, there is a political declaration that the 27 member states prime ministers adopted. This is a 36, 7 page long document. And this document is about the areas where we would like to keep cooperation with the British. 37 pages. It means practically, practically everything. But it's impossible, especially in the course of an, uh, 11 months. It's very difficult. So, we will have to set some priorities. But what are the priorities? Each member state has a different priority. So, it's a huge intellectual exercise how you can uh, you know, identify or define uh, uh, the priorities. The European Commission started a, a, a series of seminars in January. Between the 8th and the 20th of January, there were 14 seminars. Each uh, day had one, even two where different policy area, areas, experts uh, came together and we exchanged notes. Now what we see is that the, the three priorities is that we would like to reach as a minimum goal a free trade agreement on goods. On goods. Uh, customs free, quota free trade exchange. This is a, a minimal mutual kind of ambition. And that's realistic. This is what you can reach. And this is only an EU competence. It's European Union competence. Goods. So it's possible because then I will talk a little about the, the legal architecture of the new agreement. Who has to endorse it? The European Union or the member states? <coughs> Sorry, what is the procedure? Qualified majority voting or unanimity? This is very important. Is it a mixed agreement? Who will have to ratify it? The European Parliament or all the Member States Parliament? And certainly, depending on the final structure, the duration uh, will differ. So, but at the end of the day, uh, this is one priority. There's another priority where everybody agrees that uh, we must reach some deal. It's security policy. We know that we have a lot of challenges related to security, internal security. I don't need to mention events in London all the weekend. Just brackets, one example. Internal security problems, then external security problems. And the British, uh, the global connectivity of the British, uh, not only the British uh, military power, but also the uh, global network of the British. <coughs> I'm sorry, I will have to stop it. <laughs> Intelligent uh, services, it's very important. And the third one is fisheries. I strange from Hungarian <laughs> to talk about fisheries, because we are one of the five member states which do not have a sea. Only five <laughs> member states do not have a sea. Hungary is one of them. <laughs> but uh, we, we made it clear to the, uh, to the Commission as well that uh, just because we don't have a sea doesn't mean that we are ignorant. We are following very closely what you are negotiating with the British on fisheries rights, 
because we would like to avoid a situation where you give some concession to the British on fisheries, and in return you will give up something which is important for us. So it's uh, the trade-off uh, element is, uh, is very crucial. But we understand that uh, 22 countries are dependent on fisheries, and uh, countries like France or Denmark or Belgium or Holland, uh, it's a political issue. Less of an economic importance. I mean, and what, what does Boris Johnson say? It's, uh, he says, look, we left because we want to regain control over our waters. It's only British control. It's, this is our sovereign territory. You don't come here fishing. Uh, Bishop Barnier said no. There should be a reciprocal access to waters. So this is a, quite far from, from each other. But at the same time, you have to know that all the fish that are caught in European waters, only 6% goes to the British market. Whereas all the fish that are caught in the British waters, 87% go to the European market. So there's a lot of imbalance. But it's a political, in, you know, a political issue. Uh, sovereignty. And I think we must uh, take it seriously and we must respect uh, this sovereignty element. Now, another, another very strong condition, starting condition of the, of the European Union is that the Bible, the Bible of the European integration, competition law and state aid law. And they say that we will not be able to reach an agreement and give you access to the European markets if you don't comply with our high European standards on state aid, uh, compatible and incompatible state aid. So we, you, you cannot just subsidize your companies <coughs> in the UK so that they will uh, enjoy a competitive advantage to our players. That's against the Bible of European integration. Uh, and other standards, environmental standards, uh, uh, labor standards, uh, you know, uh, food uh, health uh, issues. These are quite, quite uh, uh, difficult and sensitive areas. And what many member states in the European Union would like to see is the British fully comply with EU standards, so they should commit themselves to the so-called dynamic alignment of EU standards. <coughs> but it's uh, probably, politically, not sellable at home for him. But Boris Johnson said that, look, British stand standards uh, are sometimes higher than the EU average. And uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Our environmental standards, social security standards, labor protection standards are higher than yours. And we commit that there will be no regression. So we will not divert it down, downwards, downside. And this should be enough for you. And at the same time, the British said, Look, we would like to be global again, and we will start negotiations with you in the future, but we will start with the rest of the world. And primarily their ambition is to reach a quick trade deal with the United States of America, <coughs> also Asia, India, Singapore, <coughs> Australia, New Zealand. But what uh, Boris Johnson very specifically identified <coughs> is that he would like to reach a Canada-type trade agreement with the European Union. As you know, the EU reached a free trade agreement with Canada in 2016, and the provisional application has started. And uh, it's quite uh, a comprehensive one, because it entails uh, not only the exchange of trade of goods, but also many services, including uh, access to government procurement issues. As a result, for example, it is a Canadian company which is building the French railways. And it's good for, it's a, it's a good model. What the Canada type deal does not entail is uh, financial services. And that's exactly where the British might be sensitive because 80% uh, of their economy is very much based on financial, financial services and providing financial services, the city of London and all these uh, structures. 
Now, where is the Hungarian interest? First of all, we would like to have a, a quota free, free customs free uh, trade deal. Uh, the UK will be our largest trading partner outside the European Union. It, I mean, we are now the largest trading partner of our, of the, outside the EU, although it's only 3% of Hungarian export that goes there. But there are about five to 6,000 Hungarian SMEs which are very much dependent on the British market, especially in the agricultural sector. Uh, for instance, uh, if you buy frozen corn in the UK, it's probably from Hungary because we are the largest exporter globally. And uh, Hungarian producers will certainly find uh, a lot of competition once they reach a deal with other parts of the world because they will have to compete with corn from Mexico and China and the US uh, and you name it. So the situation will be certainly worse, <coughs> at least in the first, first phase. Another problem is that how will Brexit affect the global supply changes? And the big multinational companies, how they will, how they will uh, behave? Uh, just mentioned over the lunch that uh, there was this news of this week, which is uh, surprising in a way that the Japanese uh, car giant Nissan uh, uh, made a statement that should the EU not be able to reach a comprehensive deal with the UK, that they will uh, downplay their European manufacturing facilities in Barcelona and in France, and they will redouble their UK-based manufacturing facilities. And this is a big blow to the remainers. Because they are whining already, I'm sorry for the word, uh, I respect them, like everybody else, that it will be terrible for the, for the UK, and this is the end of the British Empire, and whatever, uh, but uh, I don't know, we don't know exactly, and this is the big question of the, of the future, that uh, whether the United Kingdom as a sovereign nation can really live with the <coughs> global connectivity, their impact on the world uh, through the English language, through the history. And I believe, that, I've always believed that, regardless of Brexit, that the United Kingdom is a global power. Probably the only one in Europe. And uh, when I talk about global power, I mean uh, a global power is a country which has interest all over the world from Patagonia to Northeast Asia, and is able to defend these interests. And I think the United Kingdom is the only such European country. And uh, of course, it's also very important that they are a member of the permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations in New York. They are a nuclear power. And uh, since Friday, there is only one European Union country in the Security Council of the UN. And this also signals the relevance of the European Union. Our interest is to make the European Union politically safe, uh, physically safe, secure, economically relevant and competitive, and that's the Hungarian rule. But I think that Brexit can be, it probably should be, a lesson uh, to everybody in Europe that something went wrong. Uh, and we can analyze who is in charge, who is responsible for Brexit, and it's a, it will take years until, and we will never agree at the end of the day, because it depends from which angle you approach. But certainly that's a, that's a very bad development eventually when they leave. But our, our interest cannot be anything else than to to have a, uh, a very steady cooperation with them. It depends on the British exactly what they want. Uh, if you want to marry someone, but the other partner doesn't want to marry, then there will be no marriage. So it, it, it takes two. Uh, it depends a lot on their ambition. We don't know what their ambition is, and probably, uh, as the negotiations are with a character that nobody comes out with the, the true cards, I don't expect any breakthrough until the end of this year. So probably uh, you will see the true colors only at the end of this year, after October, November and December. It's a kind of chicken game. 
It's a kind of chicken game. Uh, who has more patience? The president of the commission uh, from the Lions said that the negotiations will be hard, fair, and quick. It sounds very well. And we hope it will be, we know that it will be hard. We hope it will be fair, but I don't know if it will be quick or not. Uh, what is uh, quite uh, sure that Boris Johnson will never agree to an extension of the transition period. Politically speaking, it's not realistic that after he communicates that Brexit is done, it's over. Yesterday in his speech he even said that we should forget the word Brexit. It's a word of the past. It's history. It's done. Now we are looking to the future and we will revive uh, the British Empire, economically speaking. We don't know whether they will be able to do or not. A lot will depend on how the Americans will respond. It's a difficult year for them, election year in the United States of America. They will be absorbed in many other issues as well. The world has not become more secure than before, so it's not easy. Uh, the Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians would like to trade with the EU as well. So, you know, the Hungarian position as we are a loyal EU member, we are part of the unity of the 27, but uh, we look at the British with a lot of respect, because if you don't do that, then it will be difficult to reach a deal with them. And on a bilateral scale, uh, wherever it is possible, because of EU law, we would like to develop our cooperation. And of course, there are many internal issues in the UK, which I would not like to touch upon because that's an internal issue, on a very sensitive one. The devolved rights of the parliaments in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, a difficult issue. Uh, and the Scottish independence uh, desire. Although you should know that 50% of the Scots are very much eager 50% is not that much. Yes, they reached 51. <laughs> it's changing. Pro, pro, I mean, pro in that in the, in the Well, I mean, my region. personal opinion is that uh, if Boris Johnson cannot reach a, a good deal with the EU, this will certainly strengthen the independence movement in Scotland. <coughs> so there is also a political stake in this respect, but that's a British internal issue. Uh, we, like Scotland, we have many bilateral encounters with Scotland, different areas, but uh, it's part of the United Kingdom. Ireland is another uh, interesting issue. Ireland is probably the most affected country by the Brexit from the EU 27, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and there are special arrangements for Northern Ireland, as you know, where Johnson eventually agreed in order to reach a deal that uh, Northern Ireland becomes a part of the customs area of the United <coughs> Kingdom, but at the same time, it also remains to be part of the uh, customs union of the European Union, which is a very, very tricky situation. So there are two borders, as a matter of fact, uh, a regulatory border over the Irish Sea between Great Britain and the island of the whole of Ireland as one regulatory border, but the Sovereignty border, the constitutional border is between Ulster, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland. Although physical border is not a reality, it's not possible, because uh, it would undermine the peace agreement reached 20 years ago, the Good Friday Agreement, which uh, resulted in the end of hostilities, in the troubles, and uh, the decommissioning of terrorist organizations like military or para, I would say paramilitary organizations like the IRA and the Ulster Unionist uh, paramilitary <coughs> organizations. So it, it was, it's a brief process. It's only, only 22 years. It's a short period of time. <coughs> and uh, one thing that people tend to forget that it's not only the British which have huge lobby power in Washington, but the Irish as well. Uh, there are 46 million people in the United States of America who say that family-wise they are partly Irish. And big political families, the Kennedys and the Clintons and others, are uh, related to Ireland. So Ireland is hooked big time in, in politics in DC. 
uh, and it's also a factor. And it, you know, the Good Friday Agreement was reached with the auspices of not only the EU but also the Americans, the Bill Clinton administration at the time. So it's also a, quite a complex issue. And if you look at look at the European uh, headquarters of the big American companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, they are all in Dublin or in Cork, and they are not in London or in Manchester. Uh, so it's very complex, you know. From this part of the world, Central Europe, from Ursen or Budapest, we are watching and we try to be in any way in this uh, forum. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I hope I can give you an answer. Thank you very much.